With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. I'm glad that you're joining us today, whether in person or online. And I want to welcome those watching online from either near or far. And if you're new to Propel, I encourage you to uh, connect with us by filling out a connect card at Propel Church AZ, which is our app that you can download in your app store. And so, so great to have you here today and to be watching, engaging with us and to stay in contact with Propel by filling out that connect card. Well, today we're going to finish our book of James series that we've been in the last few weeks. And I encourage you to grab your Bibles, whether the paper format or the digital format. If you can grab your outline on version or Propel Church AZ app. And uh, if you would also silent your phone so you're not a distraction to those around you. Uh, we're going to jump in today and we're looking at chapter 5 and finishing up this series. It's Again, the book of James is only five chapters. He says a lot in just five short chapters. Uh, chapters, but the context again of James's book is how to live out our faith or what should our faith look like as believers, how we can live out our faith in a practical way. And he talks about a few things in chapter five that we're going to cover today, beginning with giving. But before we get to that, I want to share, uh, share a story first. There was a, a wealthy older man who had great wealth and a great net worth. And the older he became, he became and, and, and grew in becoming cheap. In fact, his wife called him a tightwad. You've heard that term, right? And so he came home from the one doctor appointment one day and he told his wife that the doctor had told him that he had a terminal illness that he would not recover from. And so he told his wife that I have one last wish before I die. And that is when I die... I want you to bury all of my wealth with me in the casket. I want you to put all of the money in the casket, everything that I own. And his wife said, well, what about me? What about our kids? What about our church and the charities that we give to? What about all of them? And it didn't matter to him because he said, that's my only wish. My dying wish is that you put all of my money, all of my wealth in the casket with me. And so several months later, the man finally passes away. And at the funeral, it was time to close the casket. And so his wife goes up to the casket to say her final goodbye. And she has this little box in her hands. And as she nears the casket, she leans over and places this little box inside the casket. And all of her friends that were at the funeral, even some of her family members are going, what is she doing? What is she, what's in that little box? Why is she placing that in the casket? And when she sat back down, one of her friends asked her that very question. What did you have in that little box and why did you place it in the casket? And so the widow explained to her friend that her husband had a dying wish that he wanted to put all of his money, he wanted her to put all of his money in the casket with him. And so she said, I wrote him a check and put it into that little box of all his wealth and placed it in the casket. And then she said, if he can cash it, he can spend it. <laughs> now, how many of you know that we can't take our money or possessions with us? We can't. They stay here. It's only our soul that goes to live with the Lord forever. And so in looking at James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, James cuts to the chase, or he speaks straightforward about the rich and their selfishness. He doesn't sugarcoat or soften the words, but he gets right to the point. And this is what he says in verse 1. He says, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. 
You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. So James deals with the selfishness and the nearsightedness at the blessings and wealth that people have. And he starts off by saying, listen, you rich people. Now you're probably thinking in this moment, well, these verses don't apply to me because I'm not rich. But this passage does apply to all of us. Because in the context of wealth, in the context of riches, a large portion of the world's population lives on only a few hundred dollars a year. So in comparison to that context, you and I are rich. And I'm not telling us this morning to make us feel guilty or to feel bad or to manipulate you in some way, but in looking at the facts, we live blessed lives in this nation even if we don't have a lot. And James says people's wealth has grown to the point that they hoard it. They're so focused on self-indulgence and they will attain and amass and collect and, and grab all of what they can here on this earth when in, in reality, none of it goes with us when we leave. Have you ever seen the show Hoarders? It is amazing and crazy as to what people will hoard in their life. It's amazing to see when this TV show goes into some people's homes that are they're hoarders and they... They try to get through just a path to get through their home and they got all this stuff just cluttered and sitting everywhere within the home. And James addresses this. And he even continues on in this passage that we just read by addressing those who employ people and have not paid them properly. And he says, the cries of the workers have reached God's ears. Now, you and I might not be in this exact place because we're not an employer, in what James is describing, but he does talk about living a lifestyle of being a giver and not a hoarder. And so for a few minutes this morning, I want us to look at attitudes of life who gives. These are attitudes that we should have as believers when it comes to the area of wealth and resources. Now, the Bible doesn't condemn the accumulation of wealth, but it does talk about how we should deal with it. It's not wrong to have money, it's not wrong to have things or possessions, but how we deal with them can be good and pleasing to the Lord or it can be wrong and sin before him. And so the first attitude of a life who gives is this. That person doesn't hoard greedily, but stewards wisely. Doesn't hoard greedily, but stewards wisely. Now Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, and this is what it says. Then Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus is saying here that there is all kinds of greed here on the earth. We are tempted by all types of greed in our time here on the earth. It could be money. It could be different possessions. It could be different things that we can attain or a, a, a status in our life that we are trying to achieve. And Jesus was saying life is not about the many possessions or things that we can collect or hoard. Not about how much money we can attain. And when we get stingy like that because we become self-indulgent or we try to focus everything on ourselves, we isolate ourselves from others. In fact, the hoarding of our wealth and possessions pushes others away just as if you were trying to walk into a home where someone hoarded and you couldn't get into there, it keeps people away. Their hoarding keeps people away from coming to their house. And here's the fact that the stingy life, the one who's selfish in that way, one who hoards, is a lonely life. On the outside, it may seem that they have or appear to have everything but inside they are really lonely because they pushed others aside. Instead, life is about being a good steward with what we're giving. It's about being a good steward with what God's blessed us with. Being a good steward and being a blessing to others. Life is not about being greedy, but being a wise steward of everything we have because ultimately it all really belongs to God anyway, the Bible tells us. 
And so the problem is not having possessions. The problem is when possessions have us. And so the second attitude of a life who gives doesn't handle deceitfully, but distributes honestly. James is talking about deceit here in these verses. He's talking about the employer and the employee. He's talking about the supervisor, the one who is in charge, making sure that there's honesty in how we treat and deal with others. That we're not holding on to something that rightfully belongs to someone else. That we're honest in dealing with the blessing that is on our life so that there's not a mistreatment towards someone we owe. The third attitude of a life who gives doesn't spend selfishly, but shares generously. Shares generously. We can live a life of spending on ourselves all the time, is what James is talking about, or we can live a life that God rewards of sharing generously with others. And James was addressing the rich here. Again, in the context of our world today, you and I are rich compared to a majority of the world. And James was saying that we can live a a luxurious life all to ourselves and we can be self-indulgent. But if we do that, if we live that way, we've condemned or taken out the one who wasn't even in opposition to us. The ones who are not working against us, but because our eyes are on ourselves and our focus, we forget others in our path. And they're not even opposing us, but we put them to the wayside because of our hunger for things and to hoard, all because of selfish motives. And so it says in Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 that one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed themselves. So the one who gives freely, when we give freely and we're generous, we're going to gain even more and we'll prosper because God always returns the blessing that we give towards others. The one who is selfish and withholds will come to poverty because they're trying to hold on to it for themselves. And the one who refreshes others or is generous with others will be refreshed personally. So church, God calls us to have a right attitude when it comes to our wealth, possessions, and giving James is talking about here. Now he goes on in verses 7 to 12 to talk about this. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains? You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. So James is saying in verse 12, don't make promises or or swear to others that you're going to do this or that for them, right? We've all been there like, okay, I promise you, I I swear I'll be there. I'll be at there this time. I promise you, I'll tell you I'm going to be there. And he says, don't do that. Just make it a simple yes or no. Can you make it or can you not make it? Can you do it or not? Make it simple. Otherwise, we are held and bound to that and we are found guilty when we break that. And so we need to follow through And either are yes or no, either way. And so in verses 1 through 6 that we already read, we've looked at the attitudes of a life who gives. And in verses 7 through 12 here, James gives us the actions of one who gives or one who is a giver. We need the proper motive and heart in giving, but also the proper actions in following it through. Here are a few actions of a life who gives. The first is be patient. In light of waiting for Christ to return, James says, or in waiting for Jesus to come back for us so we can go to heaven for all of eternity, or in light of what God's blessed us with, be patient with the life that God has given us here and now. Meaning this, be patient with yourself. We're all in process. We're all learning. We're all growing. Be patient with others. Don't grumble and complain about other people. Be patient with the Lord's timing. 
God's timing is perfect in our life. Be patient with God's promises. Be patient with God's plan. Sometimes we, we're like, God, where are you? I, I, don't, I don't see you. I don't hear you in the moment. But God, where are you? Where's your plan for me? How do I see for the next step? Be patient with God's plan for your life. Be patient when we're in the middle of suffering. When, the, when we're, in the, we're in the middle of walking through a big trial or tribulation or problem with our life. Be patient in the middle of that. Because when there's patience, there's clarity. And we can see clear what God is trying to speak to us, what he's trying to show us, what he's trying to reveal to us. But when we're in a rush or hurry, it's difficult to have clarity. A second action James says is to persevere. We have to persevere through the good times as well as the bad times. Now, we all know that it's easier to persevere in the good times. When everything is going right, when everything is going well, when everything seems easy, it just falls into place. Man, it's easy to persevere in those times. We can keep going forever and ever and ever. It's rejuvenating when everything is going right. But when things go wrong or we have bad days or bad seasons and there's a trial that could be a spiritual attack, it could be a part of the spiritual battle, it could just be life itself, we have to persevere even in those moments. We have to stay the course. We can't give up on God. In suffering, we gotta keep moving forward with having a right heart and a right mindset that we're gonna be patient and we're gonna persevere. A third action is to be consistent. I love that we're a consistent church. We're consistent in coming together to worship God, loving one another, to growing and being involved in the life of the church. And so when it comes to the action of a life who gives, be consistent in giving and always, not just tithes or offerings or missions giving, but giving of your time to be involved in the local church. Giving of your time to be involved and propel. Be consistent in your serving. Be consistent in showing care to one another as well as to the others outside of these four walls. And the fourth action is to show compassion. Show compassion. Understand that consistent compassion can change a community for Christ. Reaching out to others to show compassion lets others see who Jesus is in you and I. Letting others know that you care for them, that you love them. Again, Jesus always showed compassion to others. And we see that in the scriptures. He always took the time with people to show them compassion. Why? Because he loved them. And so we as believers, we as followers of Christ need to be patient. We need to persevere. We ought to be consistent and show compassion in living out our faith as a giver. Moving on to this next section in chapter 5. James says in verses 13 through 15, he says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So James is talking about healing in these verses, and he's reminding us here that God still heals. It's amazing to me that some don't believe that God heals today. They see or read about Jesus healing people in the New Testament, but they don't believe that he actually heals today. He does. And yet Hebrews 13, 8 says in our Bible that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals. He still heals people today. There is no sickness or disease that he cannot heal. And I've seen God heal people miraculously with his supernatural power. I've experienced God's healing in my body at different times within my life, so I know that he heals personally. And yet there are times where we haven't seen the healing on this side of heaven, and we wonder why. Well, I want to give you a verse found in 2 Timothy where Paul is writing to his son in the faith, and it brings peace to our hearts and minds when we question or wonder about 
why this or that person have not received their healing on earth. And Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, amen. So what is this verse telling us? God rescues us or heals us from every evil attack and he will safely bring us home to his kingdom in heaven. Think about that. Sometimes he heals us here on earth and other times people receive their healing when they get to heaven. But for our lives as believers, it's a win-win. We never lose with God. We will never lose with God. So whether I'm here on earth or in heaven, God still heals. Sometimes we don't understand why people don't receive their healing here on earth. But yet, we can still have peace in the midst of those questions. To have faith to, to really trust God. Say, God, we don't understand all the, the reasons why, but God, we trust you. His life is in his hands. He's numbered our days, Scripture says. So we don't have to live in fear, but we live in faith. Trusting God to know that he rescues us from every single evil attack, and one day he will bring us safely home to his kingdom in heaven. So in living out our faith, we should never stop praying for healing. We should never stop asking God for healing, whether it's for our life or for someone else's life, because God's still in the healing business. James also says here that God is also concerned about our soul. James talks about us confessing our sin to each other and praying for one another so that we're healed from the turmoil within. He's not talking about a physical healing, but the spiritual healing on the inside of our heart and life. He's referring to the wholeness that God wants to bring to every part of our life because he cares about our soul or the part that will live on for eternity. Again, our body stays here when we die. It's our soul that goes to be with the Lord. In fact, we're given a new body, the Bible says, when we get to heaven one day. And James says here that the prayer of a righteous person or someone who is in right standing with Jesus is powerful and effective. Church, God wants us to pray in faith, believing that God is gonna answer in his timing. Every single situation every single day, every single opportunity that we have in our life. He wants us to pray in faith. And so along with this, God wants us to grow in our faith. James is talking about we should be growing in our faith continually. Hebrews eleven six 6 says this, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We can't even please God without having and putting our faith in him. And it starts at the point of salvation when we believe that there is one true God and that his name is Jesus and he came to give his life for us. And so we put our faith in Jesus in that moment. But even beyond that, we should always be growing in our faith. Our faith should continue to grow larger and larger and larger. Why? Because God is always at work trying to grow our faith. Sometimes we blame so many different things on the enemy. When we are in a spiritual warfare, we do have a spiritual battle. We have a real enemy. But yet sometimes God is working in the situation, working all things together for our good because he's trying to grow our faith in him. And so we need to surrender to him in that way. And then James here gives us an example of Elijah whose prayer was powerful and effective. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we need to live to that. We need to live in faith in that way. And then he gives us a personal example of Elijah. And this is what he says in verses 17, 18. He says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. So basically James is saying, don't put Elijah on a pedestal just because he was a man of God, just because he was a prophet, just because he saw signs and wonders and miracles take place. He's not God. He's a human being like you and I are. And then James goes on, he says, Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. So James uses or names Elijah as an example in 1 Kings 17 and 18 
who, again, he prayed for the rain to stop, and it did for three and a half years. Now, that, that's a drought, if you didn't know. Three and a half years without rain is a drought. And then he prayed again, and this time that it would rain, and it began to rain. And so in speaking in the context of faith here in regards to Elijah and applying to our lives, faith begins with a word from God. Faith begins in our life when we have a word from God. James is referencing Elijah again in 1 Kings 17, 1, which says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So faith starts at the point of us having a word from God, whether his written word or his spoken word to us. You and I can count on God's written word and spoken word to us. But just talking about his written word, every one of these verses in this Bible is a promise for our life. Everything that we'll ever deal with in life is found in here. And our response to it and how we should live, just as James is telling us as a whole. But we can count on God's written word and put our faith in his written word because we know that it will accomplish every single thing that he intended to. In fact, that's what Isaiah 55, 11 says. God said in, in this verse that it is the same with my word. He said, I send it out and it always produces fruit. I will always accomplish what I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it so God's word in other words never returns void or empty for our lives as the Bible tells us God sends out his word whether written or spoken and it always produces fruit it accomplishes what he wants what he wants it to do and it prospers wherever he sends it second after faith begins with a word from God Faith continues when we hold on to what God said. We have to hold on to that word. We have to hold on to God's promises in his word. In 1 Kings 18, God told Elijah in the third year of the drought to present himself to King Ahab and God would send rain. And so Elijah did this and he had the showdown, if you recall, on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. And God revealed himself on the top of that mountain as the one true God. And then we know from the passage that Elijah prayed for rain. And this is what Elijah said then in 1 Kings 18, verses 43 to 44. Elijah said, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. And so Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So I want you to see this morning that Elijah did not give up praying just because it didn't rain immediately. Now, again, Elijah was a man of God. He was in right standing with God and he saw a lot of miracles. He performed a lot of miracles, a lot of signs and wonders. And yet here he is in this moment, he had gotten the word from God that he was supposed to pray for rain because God was going to send rain now. And so he didn't give up praying just because it didn't rain the first time. He didn't come down off the mountain because the answer didn't, didn't come through. He continued to hold on to what God had said, and he had his servant check seven times to see if a cloud was starting to appear. How many times do we give up praying before we see God's answer come through? We become frustrated or we we say, God, I've been doing this. I've been doing this for two hours now and I I don't see your answer yet. God, where are you? God, I I don't see the answer. It's been two days. It's been two weeks. God, it's been two months. It's been two years. God, where's the answer? And we give up before we see the fruition of God come through. Elijah prayed seven times. Now, don't you think his servant probably said, what's your, what's your problem? I know you're the man of God. I'm here to you know, serve the Lord and serve you. And man, you prayed one time. You prayed two times. You prayed three, four, five, and six times. What's going on, Elijah? Why don't we just pack it up and go home? But yet, in our lives, do we give up after the the first time? Do we give up after the seventh time? Or even the hundredth time? 
God calls us to be faithful in continuing to hold on to his word, hold on to his promise, and we continually go back to the Lord because God will fulfill his word. He promises that to us. And that's why Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time in God's timing, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We're called to pray in faith and to continue until we see God come through with the answer. Plain and simple. And if we give up, we may miss out on the answer or harvest that God wants to bring to our lives and situation. The third thing is, Faith is a process that goes from a small beginning to a large display. The next verse in 1 Kings 18, 45 and 46 says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with the clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So the rain came because Elijah didn't give up. Because he was obedient to what the Lord had told him, he held on to the word of God, and he waited for God's timing until he saw the cloud begin to appear. He had a word from God and continued to hold on to that word. You see, church, faith is a process in our lives. We don't start with a lot of faith a lot of times, but we, be, we begin in a situation or circumstance with a small amount. And as we trust God and hold on to his promises, our faith grows and we can experience the grand display of our faith in God. Zacharias says in chapter four, verse 10, he says, who dares despise the day of small things? In the New Living Translation, it says it this way, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. God doesn't despise the small beginnings we have. He doesn't despise the small amount of faith that we may have in him. It may not be a large faith in the moment, but if our faith is pure, even as the size of a mustard seed, Jesus says, we can do anything in his name. In fact, God rejoices and gets excited when we put our faith in him in whatever circumstance. And so when we have a small beginning, God takes the little faith that we have and he grows it into a mature faith as long as we hold on to God's promise, as long as we trust him and we don't give up. So the small beginning you have is just the beginning to a large display of your faith down the road and a display of God's faithfulness as he brings his word and promises to pass in your life and situation. God is so good. And he's so faithful. It's always a win-win with God. Last, James closes out his book with verses 19 and 20 by saying this. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Very interesting how he closes out his book. Again, he's speaking straightforward. He cuts to the chase and he brings it all back around to this. He's saying, remember that the greatest miracle of all is eternal life through Jesus. The, you can, we can see signs and wonders and miracles and we can put our faith in God and we can trust him and we're gonna see amazing things in our life. We're gonna see miracles in our life because God is faithful. And when we put our faith in him, we're gonna experience those miracles. But he's saying, don't forget that the greatest miracle of all is eternal life. It's salvation through Jesus. He's saying that a heart that's changed by God is the greatest miracle. A heart or life that enters heaven one day for all of eternity is nothing short of a miracle because of who our, our God is. God saving you and I from eternal separation from him and transforming our heart and life is the greatest miracle of all. We can never forget that. And that's why we need to put our faith in sharing God's love and testimony and being a witness and the light and the truth to others around us. Because God wants to see more of the greatest miracles of all and others who don't currently know him and walk with him. So to sum up what James has been teaching us, we must live in faith when it comes to trials and temptations in our life. When it comes to listening and doing 
not showing favoritism, but putting our faith in action, taming our tongue, living in godly wisdom, submitting ourselves to God and having a right attitude and action in the area of giving and being patient and praying in faith. James dealt with all of that in these five chapters and teaches us how to live it out practically. And so this is a blueprint for how we need to live our lives in faith. And I wanna encourage you, church, today that we need to live in faith more than ever before in our lifetime. We're living in interesting days, interesting times. Scripture talks about this, and over the next few weeks, I'm gonna kind of look at and share what I feel that God is saying in this hour based on his word and the truth of his word and where, where are we at in this moment. We need to live in faith like never before. This is the time that God calls us to. And God is faithful. He's so faithful in our lives. Today, you may not have a lot of large faith for whatever need that you have, for whatever situation you're facing in your life. But I'm calling you, God's calling you today. Just put even just a little faith. Put a little faith into his word. Stand on his promises today for your life and situation. Because God is faithful. And as we put our pure little faith in him, God's going to not only grow our faith, but he's going to bring a large display of his miraculous power, his healing, his provision, his restoration in all different ways in our hearts and lives. But it starts with us saying, God, I'm going to put my faith in you. Would you bow your head this morning and close your eyes? And Maybe you're sitting here this morning or you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to encourage you today that there is no greater decision that you face in your lifetime other than accepting the fact that God loves you, that Jesus Christ is God and he came to bring salvation and eternal life for your life. And he is the only way. He's the only answer and solution. And so if that's you today, my friend, if you're listening or watching this message and you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna pray a prayer right now of salvation. And I just encourage you to pray along with me in your heart, in your mind, to receive and accept Christ in your heart and life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross for me. I thank you that you took my place so that I can be forgiven. I repent of my sin. I turn from all my sin and I turn to you. I need you, Jesus. I accept you into my heart and my life and I choose to live for you all of my life for the rest of my life here on earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live in faith. Help us to live the way that your word calls us to. And we thank you that you are the way maker for every situation, for every problem, for every need that we face. May we keep our eyes on you and live with a pure faith in you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone say.